And I, I will start by telling you two very short stories. The first story is about the book and how, uh, and, and how the book is, the idea of the book is born. I'm actually, I'm currently visiting professor at, uh, at uh, the Federal University of Bahia. Uh, and we are doing with Valdomiro, I think we are doing uh, a very, uh, a very nice uh, experiment, which is actually what people used to do long time ago in the university. So people from different disciplines sit together, spend time together, exchange ideas and talk instead of writing grants, applications. Um, and uh, I think that this is a very important point. That's why I want to stress this. I want to tell you these stories because, <coughs> uh, you know, I really think that Knowledge uh, is something that doesn't follow the law of physics. The more you spread knowledge, the more it becomes dense. The more you share knowledge, and the more it increases. So, the, the atmosphere that I found in, in Salvador is exactly of this kind. So, fortunately, we have a constant dialogue between psychology, cultural psychology, uh, philosophy, uh, science education, and I'm really uh, enjoying it and finding, finding, finding it uh, extremely uh, enriching. So the book emerged actually from uh, our talks, our chats, um, and, uh, and personally, after reading Valdomiro's book on everyday knowledge. Mm? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I hope it's not, uh, it's not uh, embarrassing for a philosopher, but I would say that he wrote almost as a cultural psychologist. So we started to discuss uh, those ideas and then, <coughs> as Valdomiro was of course already interested in reflection, now we start to say, okay, but what do you mean by reflection in psychology? What do you mean by reflection in, in philosophy? And, and of course, the first point we discover that uh, there is not such a thing as f one philosophy or one psychology. Mm? And I think that this is very important, especially in a time in which science tends to be monological and monolithical. Mm? We forget that knowledge comes from exactly sciences, psychologies and philosophies. So, this is how we decided to edit a book that was meant to be an arena of discussion. So, no common theories, no one single perspective, no one single thesis to defend but presenting different and multivocal perspectives. So let's start, as my, my friend uh, uh, and author and, and contributor Bob Binnis say, let's start to work with the semiotic rotation of the object of reflection. And I think that the outcome is, uh, is, uh, is uh, quite interesting. It's a quite interesting beginning of uh, 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 an investigation. The second story is, <coughs> is actually is a personal story. Just a few weeks ago, I spent two weeks at the hospital for some health issues. Um, so two weeks in a hospital bed is really a long time. Okay, really a long time. Um, and as fortunately, I was was not a serious issue, so I was kind of uh, relaxed. I slept a lot, that was since a long time. Um, and I had some very interesting experiences. Uh, of course, I was trying to prepare my speech here, so I was reading the book, 
And after, it was a small hospital. So after a while, I came to know all the patients and all the nurses and all the doctors in, the, in, in my uh, department, okay? And of course, they came to know me. So they started to call me professor. So, oh, okay, it's, it's, that's the professor bed, okay? And after a while, uh, you know, when the, 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 the nurses, they want to hide a little bit or they want to have a break, they came to my room to talk. So I started, I, I, I asked my, my, my family to bring some uh, play cards. So we arranged a small, uh, a small uh, casino in my room. Uh, and one day while I was working on my talk, uh, one of the nurses came and said, oh, what are you doing? What are you reading? I was reading the book, actually, again. I said, oh, that's English, but what are you doing? And so I said, oh, no, I'm, I'm preparing a talk about reflection. And then the guy and, uh, and uh, the other patients as well, they said, oh, what's, about, what's reflection? What do you mean? So I, it was a very nice experience to try to explain in lay terms the content of this book. And it was even more interesting to explain that to people working in healthcare. Hmm? Why? Because the second thing that you have when you are in a hospital bed, a lot of free time to think and observe. And what I observe is, I want to share these, re these reflections with you. So, the first thing is that um, when you have a lot of time, uh, you actually start reflecting a lot. Mm -hmm. So, for me, this was an interesting uh, experience because actually I say okay but so reflection does not emerge necessarily when you are involved in something when you are committed with something on or when so to speak you your environment is full of stimuli is full of um, prompts to act or to do something so it's very interesting how reflections, reflection can emerge from, I would say, from emptiness in a certain sense. The second thing is, uh, there is a very nice chapter by Shogo Tanaka, a Japanese colleague, phenomenological psychologist, about uh, reflection and embodiment. Well, the second thing you learn in the hospital is that the, your body is constantly under scrutiny by yourself and by the other. When you are at the hospital, every small variation of your body becomes really meaningful. Of course, yourself, you become so self-aware and so self attentive to your body, but also the other people. So, the, in a certain sense, I really got the sense of Shogo Tanaka point. So the body is an arena, very important, in which a lot of things happen. Uh, and the body is an object to myself, to the others, but at the same time, it's the most, one of the most sensitive tools that we have to trigger reflection. Um, and another point which has to do with body, and I think that, that Shogo only uh, marginally touches it, is pain is a source of awareness. And pain is a deep source of reflection. We have, for instance, in phenomenological psychology, we have one of, of the most relevant uh, works which is Viktor Frankl. And all Viktor Frankl 
reflections start from his embodied experience of pain in the concentration camps. Mm? Um, but at the same time, you learn that medicine is dogmatic, deeply dogmatic, especially hospital medicine and surgery. What I learned is that the way of thinking of doctors in the hospital is highly uh, um, um, normative, I would say, and is protocol based. So the idea is for every kind of effect, we have a cause and we have an action. So the idea is that if you have a pain here, okay, so that's because something, and the protocol says you have to take this medicine. If the first protocol fails, you have a second protocol, and so on and so forth. And it's really dogmatic. I mean, you don't really negotiate anything with the doctors. Hmm? When uh, so, in a certain sense, I would say that the everyday exercise of medicine is not reflective at all, it's protocol based. When it becomes reflective? When protocols fail. So, in the moment in which the protocols do not work, then the doctors are required to perform a real interpretive action. Hmm? So they have to go back to semiosis in the original sense. So they have to interpret the signs of the body. Hmm? So another very interesting point is reflection emerging from emptiness, from pain and from failure. Hmm? I think, I think this is what I learned in the hospital, and I think it's very important for our discussion. So, <clears throat> uh, what's next? Um, I think you are not so familiar with cultural psychology, which is, in any case, a marginal area among the psychologists. But I, I want to tell you a couple of things, okay? Um, Um, well, I don't want to compare or to discuss the different, uh, the different meaning of the, of the concept we use in philosophy and psychology, because it's not a matter of comparison, it's a matter of dialogue. So, I just pinpoint some, some um, issues that I think could be productive if we discuss it uh, between our, uh, our two disciplines. Of course, of course, first of all, cultural psychology is, uh, is uh, about the relationship between higher mental functions. So the mental functions that in our, in our terminology that involve symbolic work. Hmm? Uh, and the uh, uh, the relationship between the higher mental function and the environment. Okay. The other second, second important point is that we, our unit of analysis, analysis is the unit of the mind and the environment. So we treat them as inseparable. The organism, so to speak, is not separable from his environment. Mm? So uh, in a certain sense, every higher psychological fun function is highly situated, is not just a product, is a producer of the environment. And of course, this implies the unity of mental function. This is one fundamental point of Vygotsky. So you cannot treat remembering as separated from affection, from imagining, hmm? or from perception. It's like, you know, if, and this is one big point in, in psychology. So the idea that how do you understand 
There are two ways of understanding how uh, an engine works. Mm. The mainstream psychological way is basically to dismantle the engine and look at the pieces. Okay? But that's not understanding how the engine is working. To see the engine working, you have to assemble it. Mm. The second, I think, po interesting point is that philosophy has to do with truth. While the object of cultural psychology is meaning. And I think that one of the points that we could explore further is what is the relationship between truth and meaning? A truth is 2 plus 2 is 4. But that could be completely meaningless for a person, although it is true. The second interesting point for me is that philosophy, in a certain sense, is about the conditions hmm, of knowledge. While psychology, or cultural psychology, is interested in the sociogenesis and the ontogenesis of knowledge. Why? Because psychology is a developmental science. So it's based on the idea that what was true yesterday, in the, in the psychological experience of course, is, not lo is no longer true tomorrow. Why? Because psychological experience is characterized by, by uniqueness. Uniqueness in the sense that I'm a unique person experiencing something, and by uniqueness, because of what we call the axiom of irreversible time. Living organisms cannot go backward in time. So the first time I do something, or I experience something, is never the same as the second time. It can be similar, and of course, all culture is based on, is made uh, for giving sense to similarities. But the first time I go to school is not the same of the second time I go to school. My first loaf is not the second, is not the same than the second. Okay? And the last point that I think could be interesting is uh, the idea of what we call cogenetic logic. So the idea that if you treat organism and environment as a unity, you can conceptualize also, <coughs> I, I, I will just sum up this point. Uh, you have that your object of study is, is by definition characterized by a relationship of identity and non-identity at the same time. Mm? So this is what we call, call cogenetic logic. So these are just some suggestions for further discussion. And the last point that I think is particularly topical nowadays is that <clears throat> for cultural psychology, psychological we don't talk about psychological states. We talk about psychological processes. Hmm? Psychological processes are purposeful. Human beings are purposeful. They create their own goals. And this is very important because in a certain sense, uh, it goes against the idea of a hierarchy between an animal and a second level reflective state. So the idea that human action is based on a pyramid of needs hmm, is not necessarily true. We don't act uh, for self-fulfillment or self-destruction destruct only when we have satisfied lower level needs. You see in human action that we can act instead 
on the reverse side. So self-destruction or self-fulfillment can be done against basic needs. Hmm? Why this is important? Because reflection is critical in, uh, in contemporary societies. What we have today is exactly the fact that large part of societal and political happenings are driven by completely unreflective acceptance of, can I say that, fake news. You have ruling parties in the States, in the UK, since today actually, in Brazil with Bolsonaro, in Italy with the Lega, whose politics is based exactly on the opposite of reflection, is exactly based on the systematic acceptance of what is adama uh, adamantly known true by large part of populations. So I think that is exactly why we need to develop the discourse, the, 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 the discourse, the discussion about reflection today. So these, are, these were just my spot notes. Thank you again. <laughs>